Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Are you the one? Are you the one we are waiting for? This is the question that John sends his disciples to ask Jesus. Are you the one? Well, that's a fitting question for the season of Advent, because it is a fitting question when you're asking about somebody who you're waiting for to arrive, right? The first thing it made me think of is in in movies, or maybe you've seen them in the airport, actually, the person who stands there with the sign that has the person's name on it when they're coming off the plane, because they are working on limited information. They have to identify who it is that is coming. And so rather than walking around to everybody who passes by and says, are you the one I'm waiting for? Are you the one I'm waiting for? They hold up the name. Well, this is what we are doing today. We're waiting for the one. We're waiting for the one who was prophesied, the one who was promised to set us free from our sins. We are waiting and preparing for the arrival, the advent of our King. And like John, we only know part of what we're waiting for. We don't have all the information. And this can be seen with John's interaction with Jesus because Jesus does some things that John does not expect. He clearly doesn't have all the information. Jesus has all the information and John, in those instances, needs to trust Jesus. And in our gospel reading, Jesus points him to the very thing by which he can have faith in the Son of God, in his word, in the word of God revealed. You see, you may have noticed the connection between our Old Testament reading and the gospel today, that part of Jesus' answer to John's question comes directly from the prophecies of Isaiah, that the Lord is responsible for the blind having their sight restored, and the lame leaping like a deer, and the deaf being able to hear, and all of that. And so when John asks the question, are you the one that we are waiting for? Jesus' answer is, look at what's going on. Remember the scriptures, for they have foretold of what the Son of God, the Messiah, will do. So it's very comforting on one hand, if you think about it, that John, who is the Elijah to come, the greatest mourn among women until the kingdom of heaven shows up in Jesus, even he doesn't fully understand what God is up to in Jesus. We first see this at his baptism because Jesus shows up and says, John baptized me, and John says, what? I'm not the one who should be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. And yet Jesus insists so that the word of God is fulfilled. So right away we get the understanding that even though John is playing this important role in God's plan, he doesn't really have the whole story. And again here, it's clear he doesn't have the whole story because he sends his disciples to verify whether or not Jesus really is the one. The one that they have been waiting for. And the setting in our reading today is that John has been imprisoned, imprisoned by King Herod, for he spoke out against Herod's relationship with his brother's wife, or his father's wife, I believe. And so he got thrown in jail. And the ministry of Jesus thus far doesn't really seem like what John was describing. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, the axe is at the root of the trees, God is coming with judgment and justice and is going to save his people. So, can't the Son of God do something about this Herod guy? What gives? If you're bringing the kingdom of heaven on earth, what's going on? Seems like a pretty understandable question from someone in John's predicament. Now, John never really fully doubts the Son of God and and the, the mission of God. He just didn't have the full story, and so Jesus says to his disciples, 
will tell John what you see and what you hear. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. There's only one person who can do all those things, the one whom they have waited for, Jesus. Now, Jesus might not be going about the thing in the way that you thought, but that's okay. He is who he is. And for us who know Christmas, that's not really a theme out of nowhere. I mean, if you think about from the very beginning, the incarnation of Jesus is an enigma, and it's never something that a human being would come up with as a plan to save the world. I mean, just think about from the very beginning, if somebody told you the king of the universe is coming, where would you look? Would you look in a barn? Or in a cave? Or perhaps a palace? Like the wise men, we would all probably look at the palace where the king lives because the king of kings is coming he's certainly going to have a grander place than anyone else and yet where does the king of kings show up in a stable likely in a cave in a town of very little significance apart from the prophecy in god's word bethlehem so you can see from the very beginning god's execution of his plan the fulfillment of his prophecies are not always what is expected. But they're still fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is breaking into the world of the person of Jesus, and in a way far better than is imagined by you, me, or John. It's not coming in immediate judgment. The time for the axe being at the root of the trees is not quite yet because our God, while being a God of justice, is also a God of mercy. And he's come to set the captives free, to give time for repentance and faith through the hearing of this good news that is being preached to the poor. Are you the one that we are waiting for? Jesus' answer is, yes, I am the one. Just maybe not exactly how you pictured it. So the advent of our king is always a bit unexpected. We're always working with partial information. So what do we do to prepare ourselves to recognize him? Well, we take our cue from this interaction between Jesus and John. Where does Jesus direct John's eyes to verify and answer his question of, are you the one? He directs him to his word. If you've ever been somebody who's questioned the existence of God, you've probably gone down a path of trying to prove that he exists. And the best you can do with the glory that nature attests to God is that there is a God somewhere who made all this stuff. But beyond that, apart from the revelation of the scriptures, we would know nothing else about him. So why do you come here every Sunday? I like the answer of one of my confirmation students from two weeks ago. To hear what God has to say. That's why we're here. That's what you've gathered around. Is the coming of the king to you in his word. And in his sacraments. The advent of the king right now is coming to us through those means. So that we can know him. So that we can recognize him. So that the answer to our question is made. Are you the one? Yes. I am the one, the one that you have been waiting for to set you free from your sins, the one who has come to preach the good news to you, I am the one. See, this is how we keep our story straight, by telling it over and over again, with the source material being without question from God himself written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if you really think about it, if God's plan was to save as many people as he could, and we live in a world where we have a lifespan and we pass away and new people are born, what way do you think you would come up with 
for keeping the story straight. You have witnesses. Witnesses to what is done, right? Just like he's saying here to John's disciple. Take a look around and see what's happening wherever I go. And remember the promise of God. And those witnesses preached the word to the people of God and beyond. And then it got written down and passed down from generation to generation to generation until today. So that you too have an answer to the question, are you the one that I've been waiting for? The one who will set me free from the tyranny of the sinful world that I live in, of the sinful nature that I struggle with. By hearing your word, my eyes are opened, my ears are unstopped, and I know it really is you. He is the one. The reign and rule of God is here in Jesus. It hasn't fully been completed. Because of his mercy and compassion, there is still yet time for more and more people to hear of this good news and know that he came for them too. And just like John, who played a part in that, so do we play a part in that plan. We don't know the whole story. We don't know why sometimes when we share God's word, the Holy Spirit works faith in someone, and sometimes it doesn't. But we know we're a part of the plan, and so how do we keep the story straight? We focus on God's word, his revelation about himself to us. And so we gather continually around his word. We read it on our own so that our answers are made, the answers are made clear to us. He is the one. But Advent isn't only about the waiting for Christmas. That's clearly the main focus. But Christmas means so much more than the part of the plan that John knew about. That the Son of God was coming. Because when Jesus arrives, he's among his people, but he doesn't behave like the king of kings ought, at least according to us. The king of kings dresses grandly and lives in a great big house and wields armies and powers and subjugates all those who oppose him. But our king of kings doesn't do that. Our King of Kings preaches grace and mercy. He wants you to be free from the coming judgment. So much so that he subjects himself to all of those underneath him. To the point of suffering the penalty for all their wrongdoing. For being the vessel of judgment so that you receive none. And how do we know any of this? God's word has revealed it to us. He has told us himself, just as he told John those many years ago. That's how we know of his advents among us now in the church and the one that is to come. He has told us himself. I bet like John, we don't have the full story, just like I was talking about the kids. None of us know when that day will be. We don't know exactly what it's going to look like or how it's all going to work. But God has made sure that we know a number of things for sure. And one of those is that it's going to be good. It's going to be good for those who have faith in Christ. That's why even though Advent is a penitential season, it's not one of depression. We're not dreading the arrival of the King. We are anticipating it with joy. Because we know what He has come to do. Restore creation, set his people free from their sins. And even now, more so for us in the church, we anticipate with joy knowing that he has accomplished our justification on the cross. And so his return is even more a thing of joy, for it's going to fully consummate, fully fulfill all that began at the cross and the empty tomb. And in that last Advent, as Mason pointed out, he's coming back. Now we're in the seat of John the Baptist a little bit. 
not looking at something that happened in the past, but something that will happen in the future, of which we know some, but not all. And we may ask a similar kind of question. Is it now? Is it coming soon? How will we know if it's the real one? And where do we go for our answer? In our gospel today, Jesus is directing us all to the same place. His word. He has revealed all we need to know about himself to us in his mercy. And he continues to reveal himself every time the scriptures are read among his people. And the sacrament is administered. The giving of his very body and blood that carried out the task which he came to do. The restoration of creation. The raising of the dead. The freeing of his people from their sins. So, dear friends in Christ, we go back to it again and again. We humbly pray for understanding as we engage with what God has to tell us about himself and pray for our faith to be strengthened. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me, Jesus says. It turns out that the details we expect, they don't end up being a problem for Jesus. Even though John didn't know what Jesus was up to, He still saved John. Even though the wise men first looked in the wrong place, God revealed to them the right place. And so he does with us by revealing it to us in his word. And so he concludes our gospel reading today with this phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What has he told you? He has told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you, that I'm going to return and bring you to be with me forever, that the place that I'm taking you in my kingdom, there all is made right, justice has been done, mercy has been fulfilled, and wickedness destroyed. So dear saints of ascension, until then, until that day, whenever it may be, cling to the word. See and observe what God is doing among his people this day and in the future. And know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And join with the church throughout the world in one voice saying, Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. In the name of Jesus, amen.